In this video, I'll provide a sketch of the technology and law surrounding cell site simulators. There's a remarkably rich jargon surrounding these devices. They're sometimes called IMSI catchers, IMSI standing for a type of cell phone serial number. Another term used at times by the Department of Justice is a digital analyzer. The Harris Corporation has been particularly creative with how it's named these gadgets and their accessories. Products include the infamous Stingray, as well as the Triggerfish, Kingfish, Gossamer, and Hailstorm. A subsidiary of Boeing, Digital Receiver Technology, also produces one of these devices. It's called a dirt box. You can't make this stuff up. All right, so let me start with some notes on the technology. There are many different kinds of cell site simulators. There are many different brands and many different products and many different add-ons. The capabilities of these systems differ greatly. More on that in a moment. The operating modes of these systems also differ greatly. Many models can operate in a range of configurations. I'd like to touch on some of the key differences in how cell site simulators function. One question to ask is, where is the device located? It might be stationary, or it might be in a van, or it might be portable, or it might even be on an airplane or helicopter. All of those have been used previously. Another question to ask is, is the device active or passive? Put differently, does the device actually have phones connect to it? Or does it just sit back and collect ordinary cell phone traffic that flies by? Again, both have been done in practice. Yet another question is, is the cellular carrier involved? Sometimes it is, such as when the carrier directs certain phones to connect to the device. Often it isn't, such as when the device spoofs a powerful cell tower. Here's another question. Does the device disrupt cell service? Usually it will, by not forwarding information on to the carrier. But sometimes the carrier works with law enforcement, so services aren't interrupted. Another key question is, which phones are affected? Sometimes it's just the target's phone, such as when the carrier has instructed the phone to connect to the police device. Often, though, it's all phones near the device. That's certainly cause for concern. Here's a final question. What information is collected? Very often, these devices are used to precisely spot a phone's location. But they can also be used to gather phone information, such as serial numbers, or even communications metadata or content. So I hope it's clear that there's a very wide range of possible cell site simulator functionality. And that functionality can have tremendous legal implications. If a device collects call content, for instance, plainly a wiretap order is required. And if a device is targeted and doesn't disrupt service and only collects communications metadata, then very likely a pen trap order is sufficient. As for the myriad other possible configurations, well, the law isn't settled. I'd like to give a little more detail on what seems to be the most common configuration for these devices. Suppose Alice is carrying her cell phone, and it's connected to some tower off in the distance. The police would like to precisely learn Alice's location, so they roll up with a cell site simulator. That simulator poses as a new cell tower, with a stronger signal than the actual cell towers. Alice's phone, seeing the possibility for a better connection, hops to the cell site simulator. The police can then track Alice in real time with high precision. Alice, of course, isn't the only cell phone user in the area. Many others nearby have the same carrier. Their phones are also connected to the distant tower. And when the police turn on the cell site simulator, their phones also switch over. So there's the first catch. In the common configuration, Cell site simulators collect information about many innocent individuals. The second catch is that in this configuration, the cell site simulator disrupts service. Alice and everyone near her 
will temporarily get disconnected from the real cell network. All right, so there's the most common configuration. Again, it's not the only way government agencies use these devices. There are three major legal questions surrounding cell site simulators. I'll start by flagging them, then go into a little further detail. The first question is, are cell site simulators covered by the Pen Register Act? That is, could a cell site simulator be used with just a pen trap order? The second question is, does CALEA require more than a pen trap order? As I hope you recall, a provision of CALEA prevents police from using just a pen trap order to prospectively obtain cell phone location from a carrier. The third big question is, are cell site simulators covered by the Fourth Amendment? More precisely, if the police use one of these devices, is that a search that presumptively requires a warrant? Okay, so those are the three high-level questions. Now let me say a little more about each. Let's start with the Pen Register Act. The majority view, and certainly the view held by law enforcement agencies, is that cell site simulators are covered by the Pen Register Act. So long as the device is not collecting content, it statutorily can be used with just a pen trap order. Put differently, so long as these devices aren't collecting content, they're collecting dialing, routing, addressing, and signaling information. When a phone broadcasts a trackable signal, for instance, that's signaling information. And when a phone sends call metadata, that's dialing information. It's a fairly straightforward textual argument. I hope you recall that a pen trap order requires merely a self-certification of relevance by investigators. It's a very low bar. So that's the majority view for now. There are minority views on this issue. At least one judge believes that when a cell site simulator is used to track location, it falls under the ECPA tracking device provisions. That might require a warrant. The same judge also suggested that an untargeted cell site simulator can't be authorized with a pen trap order. So, if the device is going to collect information about all the nearby cell phones, that isn't allowed. Again, those are minority views. So, there's the analysis under the Pen Register Act. Now on to CALEA. Remember how CALEA says that the government cannot get a phone's location from the carrier with just a pen trap order. That was why DOJ tried to concoct the ECPA hybrid order. So the question is, does the same protection apply here? Does CALEA require more than a pen trap order to use a cell site simulator to track a phone's location? The answer is no. I'm not aware of a court that has reached the opposite conclusion nor am I aware of a surveillance law scholar who has argued the opposite position. That's because that provision of CLIA applies only to information provided to the government by telecom carriers. That provision does not apply to information directly collected by the government. So, under CLIA, the police can track a phone's location with just a pen trap order, so long as they don't go through the carrier. And that's exactly what a cell site simulator does. Now on to the last major legal question. Are cell site simulators covered by the Fourth Amendment? More precisely, does using a cell site simulator constitute a Fourth Amendment search such that it presumptively requires a warrant? The majority view and the law enforcement view is no, at least when these cell site simulators are used to collect caller device metadata or a device's location in public. The rationale for that view is simply that the third party and public movement doctrines apply. A person knowingly discloses all this information to their cell carrier, and public movements aren't constitutionally protected. Courts reason about this issue in much the same way as they reason about prospective cell phone tracking by carriers. So that's the majority view for now. Much like with cell phone tracking, though, there is a growing minority view. 
It says that a person does have a reasonable expectation of privacy in their cell phone's location. And so, these cell site simulators are covered by the Fourth Amendment when they're used for location tracking. Finally, some scholars have tried to bridge the divide between these views. They've argued that even if a person doesn't generally have a reasonable expectation of privacy in a cell phone's public location, there's something about the operation of cell site simulators that makes them a search. For instance, disrupting a person's cell service is an interference with property, much like physically attaching a GPS tracker is an interference with property. At the time of recording, courts haven't had occasion to expressly rule on these theories. So, there's the constitutional analysis. I'd like to make a few notes on police practice, then I'll close with a recap. For over 20 years, law enforcement agencies have used these devices without warrants. Ever since the Pen Register Act was updated to cover all dialing, routing, addressing, and signaling information, law enforcement agencies have used these devices with pen trap orders. Federal and state agencies have been regularly seeking these orders, and judges have been regularly granting them. That said, law enforcement agencies have not been very candid with judges and defendants about when they use these devices and how they work. Many pen trap applications just use broad, generic language. So, the routine issuance of these orders does come with a major caveat. The final note on practice that I'd like to make is that these devices have become very popular with law enforcement agencies, even at the local level, and even when investigating lesser offenses. One contributing factor is that federal grants have greatly subsidized state and local purchases of cell site simulators. Another factor is that these devices require a much lower burden than obtaining prospective location information from a carrier. Recall that the majority view is that because of CALEA, a warrant with probable cause is required to prospectively track a cell phone through a carrier. These devices, by contrast, require just a pen trap order with a self-certification of relevance. That's much easier to obtain. All right, so enough about these devices in practice. Let me briefly recap the law. The majority view in the judiciary, for now, is that a cell site simulator only requires a pen trap order, so long as it's not collecting communications content, or a non-public location, anyway. That said, there is very little case law, and judges have largely been in the dark about when these devices are used and how they function. As the media and advocacy groups have shed light on these devices, some judges have expressed grave concerns. So, at the time of recording, this area of law is shifting, much like the law on prospective cell phone tracking. 